This is the story of Triss Marigold. The first time we hear of Triss, Geralt has yet to actually meet her. When Geralt meets Yennefer, she notes that she has a friend called Triss Marigold, who had some strong opinions on the male form. Triss also had a good sense of humor because she'd kill herself laughing when Yennefer told her that Geralt had exercised a djinn by telling it to go fuck itself and be gone. The next time we hear of Triss, it's again only in Geralt's thoughts. When Geralt visits the hill where the sorceress stood during the Second Battle of Sodden, Triss Marigold's name is listed among the 14 sorcerers that fell that day. Geralt remembered Triss as cheerful, ready to burst into laughter for no reason at all, like a child. He liked her. It had been mutual. When we finally get to meet Triss Marigold, she is on her way to Kaer Morhen through the wintry weather. Triss found the trail encircling Kaer Morhen by a large tree trunk supported by enormous boulders. The trail has many obstacles and is used by witchers to improve their running speeds and controlled breathing. Young witchers called the path the Killer. Along the trail, Triss came across Ciri, who was running the trail. Ciri slipped and Triss came to check on her. Triss, of course, first thought it was a boy training as a witcher. Ciri didn't trust her at first, but it didn't last too long, and they rode to the keep together. The moat around Kaer Morhen is littered with skulls and bones. Ciri says they should be buried, but Triss tells her the witchers treat it as a reminder of a battle long ago in which all the witchers, or the ones not at the keep at the time, were slain. Neither Triss nor the witchers will tell Ciri about the battle, which was started by fanatics calling the witchers mutants, monsters and freaks. Ciri then suddenly started talking in a strange voice, a natural, metallic, cold and menacing and Triss noticed a magical aura around her. They don't want to lie like that. They don't want to be a symbol, a bad conscience, or a warning. But neither do they want their dust to be swept away by the wind. An ordinary barrow. A mound of earth which will be overgrown with nettles. Death has cold blue eyes, and the height of the obelisk does not matter. Nor does the writing engraved on it matter. Who can know that better than you? Triss Marigold, the fourteenth one of the hill. You died on that hill, Triss Marigold. Why have you come here? Go back. Go back at once and take this child, the child of elder blood, with you. Return her to those whom she belongs. Do this, fourteenth one, because if you do not, you will die once more. The day will come when the hill will claim you. The mass grave and the obelisk on which your name is engraved will claim you. Ciri then woke up and remembered nothing. Triss decided not to linger on the subject, and they continued to care more in. When they arrive at the keep, Triss and Geralt meet in the stables, and Geralt tells her how happy he is to realize she's alive, and to see her. They hugged, then kissed, but Geralt quickly broke it up. Vesemir approached and put his hands on Triss's ass, to which Triss tells him she'll set his beard on fire if he doesn't take it off. They had prepared the best room and the best bed in the top of the tower for Triss, but she silently thinks she'd rather sleep with Geralt in the worst bed. And while in bed, she tries to think of who might have summoned her to Kaer Morhen. First, she thought of Geralt, who might have just wanted to see her. Triss has had a long history of disappointing sexual encounters. She tried women a while as well. Triss had observed her good friend Yennefer in Geralt's relationship and was jealous. So, she had seduced Geralt with the help of a little magic, and while he was vulnerable from a recent breakup with Yennefer. But Triss had not wanted to take Geralt from Yennefer. Yennefer was more important to her than Geralt. Triss then assumed she was summoned to care more and to help turn Ciri into a full witcher, as the witchers don't know how to anymore. Vesemir is the only one left from the last generation, and he was a fencing instructor only. None of the witchers knew how to use the elixirs to change into witchers. Triss is excited at the prospect to know all the witch's secrets, but feels watching Ciri die is too high a price to pay. But she quickly thought this probably wasn't why she was summoned either. She then thinks they may be feeding her infusions of their mysterious herbs to drink, and Triss would like to examine her body. She would also like to take a look at the mushrooms they feed her, so she might use that information to cure some diseases. Triss then realizes they probably want her help with Ciri, as she had been prophesizing in their presence too. She was a source. And as she's thinking and turning in her bed late at night, Triss continuously agonizes over Geralt, not throwing himself at her until she finally falls asleep. 
In the morning, Triss takes Siri to fix her jester outfit, as the witchers didn't have much of an idea on how to dress a lady. While Siri undresses, Triss notices that Siri has bruises everywhere, and Siri says it's because of her training. Triss swore viciously in Dwarvish, using inexpressibly foul language at the bruises. Siri confesses she's scared of some of the exercises. She also asks Triss if she can use her magic to turn her into a boy. Triss says she can't, so Siri instead asks her if she could do something so she at least doesn't have to get her period anymore. At that question, Triss gets very angry at the fact that witchers make her train while on her period, which she's having today. And so, a little later, while Triss scolds the witchers over not knowing about her period, Eskel asks her for help with Siri as Siri walks in, her hair cut and styled properly, wearing a dark blue dress and lovely viper necklace. She walked up to Vesemir and stated, I cannot train today, for I am indisposed, while she looks at Triss for confirmation on whether she'd set that right. Siri asks Vesemir if Triss can stay a little longer, and he agrees. Siri then says goodbye, curtsies, and goes back up the stairs again. Vesemir states to the idiots that if she's wearing a dress, there will be no exercises. Triss later warns the witchers not to go overboard on the mushrooms and herbs, as it might damage Ciri's womanly attributes. Lambert completely understands as he stares at Triss's breasts, while Eskel stares daggers at Lambert. That night, Triss braves skinning a goat to be near Geralt, while lamenting the fact that she'd be sleeping alone that night again. And just at that moment, Ciri runs down the stairs and asks Triss if she can sleep with her that night. The next day, the witches confront Triss about her loyalties. Ciri was clearly a source and they knew Triss had to tell the chapter about Ciri, as wizards used to hunt sources. But Triss says that she won't tell anyone. The witchers are quite surprised by this, as Triss's loyalty to the council and chapter were legendary. But Triss insists she'll keep her mouth shut and asks about Ciri's trances. She has had three so far, most happened after she drank White Gull. So Triss decides to test this trance and they give Ciri White Gull. And as the trance starts, Triss enters Ciri's mind. In the dream, she is a seagull, happily flying around. Then the sea disappears, and the hill of Sodden appears with a line of dead walking up the hill. Ciri pricks herself on the rose of Sherawed. Then there's talk of Ithlin's prophecy, of elder blood, the white flame, and the lion cub of Sintra. Ciri's voice then changes into the metallic voice Triss had heard before on their way to Kaer Morhen. You have come all this way with her, Triss Marigold. All the way here. You have come too far, 14th one. I warned you. Who are you? Triss asked. You will know when the time comes, the voice answered. I will know now. She cast a spell of identification and the magic curtain burst, but behind it was a second, a third, a fourth. Triss sank to her knees. There was only emptiness. You are wrong, 14th one. You've mistaken the stars reflected on the surface of the lake at night for the heavens. Trish shouted, Do not touch! Do not touch that child! She is not a child! Ciri's lips moved, but Trish saw that the girl's eyes were dead, glazed and vacant. She is not a child. She is a flame, the white flame which will set light to the world. She is the elder blood, hen Ikar, the blood of elves, the seed which will not sprout but burst into flame. The blood which will be defiled, when Ted Deirat arrives, the time of end. Vaes Deirat et began, Trish shouted again. Are you foretelling death? Is that all you can do, foretell death for everyone? For them? Her? Me? You? You are already dead, 14th one. Everything in you has already died. Trish then cast another spell. By the power of the spheres, I throw a spell on you by water, fire, earth and air. I conjure you in thought, in dream and in death, by all that was, by what is, and by what will be. I cast my spell on you. Who are you? Speak! But all that appeared was a grey sea. Fly. It is time. Go back to where you came from, fourteenth of the hill. Fly on the wings of a gull, and listen to the cry of other seagulls. Listen carefully. Triss tried to weakly conjure another spell, but the voice interrupted her and repeated she must fly. She then heard Ciri's voice again, telling her to forget him. Then she woke. She was in bed again and Geralt was sitting beside her. 
They spoke of what happened and Triss admitted that there was something trying to possess Ciri. Something too powerful for Triss. And she could not block or suppress Ciri's powers should the need arise. She told Geralt he'd need to get help from another magician. A more gifted one, more experienced. Yennefer. Triss would stay until spring to watch over Ciri, day and night. Then she'd have to go to the Temple of Melitele while Geralt asked Yennefer for help. Triss asked if Ciri had said anything when she woke, and Geralt reluctantly admitted she'd said, forget about him, don't torture him. Triss admitted that she'd try, but she could not forget and she asked Geralt to forgive her. But Geralt stated he was the one that should be asking for forgiveness, and not just from Triss. Triss realized then how much Geralt loved Yennefer and asked Geralt to stay the night with her. Only stay, nothing more. And so he does. From that moment on, Triss watched over Ciri constantly. She had forbidden the witchers to give Ciri any of their elixirs, and she also started teaching Ciri elder speech. During one of those lessons, Ciri asks Triss if she can wear makeup like Triss. So Triss gives her some eyeshadow to work with, and Ciri, as it turns out, is not very good at putting on makeup. They then decide to go sledding, and Triss notes they'll have a bath afterwards. Ciri says Lambert had told her that they take up too much fuel to heat the baths. So Triss states, Lambert kin me at bath at ars, and they go sledding. The witches are excited to leave for spring. Triss is annoyed the witches think they do enough by killing monsters, yet Nilfgaard doesn't interest them. She sits on Foltest council with Faircard and Kira Metz, and had hoped that at least Geralt would be somewhat interested in politics. They argue back and forth a while, and Triss tells of the Battle of the Hill. Her name was listed as killed because the wizards and mages around them were too horribly mutilated to recognize. She was horribly mutilated during the battle as well, as she fell to the ground during the battle with on one side next to her Joel, who was now a smoking pile of rags, and on her other side Coral, who was now only a screaming torso with no arms or legs. After the battle, the only person left who knew Triss was Yennefer, and she was blinded. Others always recognized Triss by her beautiful hair, but her hair was scorched off. Meanwhile, Ciri had sneaked in and heard when Triss said she would fight again if she had to. Ciri said she would fight with her. She wanted to kill Nilfgaard. Geralt got mad at her and forbade her to train with a sword, so Ciri ran off angrily. Triss and Geralt then ran after her and decided to leave soon for Neneke. On their way to the Temple of Melitele, Triss got very sick. Unfortunately, she's allergic to magical elixirs, and she usually treats her own ailments with amulets, which she left in Kaer Morhen. It got so bad she eventually couldn't ride her horse anymore, and they had to carry her while they try to find a place for her to rest and get better. After a while, they join a caravan escorted by several dwarves. One of them, Yarpen Zigrin, a dwarf Geralt had met before while hunting the golden dragon, Villain Trittenmerth. They lie to the caravan, telling them Triss has food poisoning, for fear they might be turned away if they thought it was anything contagious, and they're allowed to stay for a while, although Yarpen won't tell them what the convoy was for. Yarpen also notes that Geralt seems mighty attracted to Triss, to which Geralt only smiles sadly. As she rests, Triss starts talking in her sleep and tells Kevin to keep his hands to himself. While she sleeps, Yarpen and Ciri talk about how humans are very good at both screwing and murdering. When Geralt shows up and tells Yarpen to watch his words with Ciri and to mind Triss some more, Triss chimes in saying she's been awake for a while now and would like to learn more about the role of screwing in the evolution of society. When Triss started feeling a little better, Ciri and Geralt decided she needed to wash and Triss started sobbing that she envied Yennefer for Geralt, to which Geralt quickly sends Ciri away. As the caravan continues, they are suddenly attacked by a band of Scoia'tael. During the attack, Triss is almost struck down by one of the elves, but Ciri swiftly protects her and drags Triss to safety. After the attack, they continue their way to the Temple of Melitele without the caravan. The next time we meet Triss is at the banquet at Aratuza on Thanet, where she was wearing a sparkly blue and aquamarine dress. She had been talking to Drithelm of Pondvanus and his brother Deathmold, both in service of Estrad of Kovir, but they left in a hurry when Yennefer approached Triss. They talk a while, and Ciri comes up in the conversation, of course. Ciri is supposed to start her study at Aratuza that year, and Triss says that she'd like to see her. Yennefer tells her that if she finally starts teaching at Aratuza, 
as she had been asked many times before, she could see her every day. Not long after their conversation, they're interrupted by the chapter and the highest council arriving at the banquet, and Yennefer tells Geralt to fetch some wine while she and Triss talk. They have a little chat about Geralt and Triss's little thrist, and Yennefer makes it quite clear that it is not appreciated, but her and Triss still remain good friends. Later that night, after the banquet, the rebellion in Aretuza starts, and Geralt finds Triss Marigold kneeling over the dead body of Lydia van Bredevoort, Vilgefort's assistant. When Geralt enters the scene, Triss quickly jumps towards him and blinds him with a flash. Triss whispers an apology in his ear. She was protecting Geralt from her colleagues. He can't see too much. Triss is then ordered to locate and take Dordgarai, Carduin and Drithelm to Garstang, as they represent the kings. This will show Ethane and Esterad their actions and its consequences. Later, in the Tower of Garstang, when the battle between the wizards truly exploded, many were killed or wounded, Triss Marigold included. Geralt had also hurried there to find Yennefer and Ciri, who he'd lost in the chaos, but Vilgefortz blocked his way and defeated him utterly. Triss and Yennefer found him afterwards. Triss decided to teleport him away to Broccolon so he could be healed. She was swearing and crying as they treated Geralt. Triss made sure to inform Dandelion where Geralt was as well. And afterwards, she moved to Tretagor in Redania, along with Philippa, Margalita Lowentil, and Kira Metz to help Queen Hedwig. Soon after, Triss is present at the meeting between herself, Philippa Alhart, Margarita Lowentil, Kira Metz, Esiravar Anahit, Sabrina Glavasic, Sheila de Tanzerville, and Francesca Findeber, which would be the start of the Lodge of Sorceresses. They set up another meeting at a later time, which would also include Ida Emeen Absivne, Fringila Vigo, and Yennefer of Wengerberg. Yennefer at the time is of course severely distraught, and during a short break, Triss tries to comfort her by telling her Geralt was probably fine. But Yennefer can see her blush every time she speaks of Geralt. Quite a while later, Yennefer contacted Triss, who was at the time in the company of Philippa Eilhart. Yennefer asks if they're alone and if they can speak freely, and Triss lies and says they are, but Yennefer notices and Philippa shows herself. Yennefer asks for a favor, but is denied several times on several favors. In the end, Philippa doesn't care about Geralt's fate, they just wanted to use Ciri and that was all. Yennefer asks Triss what she thinks of her lodge now, and Triss asks Yennefer for her forgiveness, but Yennefer states she will never forgive her. So Triss then sets out to learn what had happened to Yennefer after their meeting, and she came across a Skelliger fisherwoman in a tavern, who was boasting about dragging Yennefer onto her boat in one of her fishing nets. She ended her story by stating that Yennefer had committed suicide by use of her own magic. So, soon after, Triss visits Kraken Crate on Art Skellig, asking about Yennefer. Crack informs her that Yennefer is not in fact dead, and tells her what has been happening on the Isles since Yennefer's arrival. They talk for a while about Ciri as well, and Triss also suspects that the Ciri that had been seen at court in Nilfgaard was in fact just the look-alike. Quite some time passes and we find Triss along with Yara and Neneke at the Temple of Melitele. They were woken up by the wild hunt passing over the temple. They all had dreams of Ciri dying, blood on her face. Night jars were singing, and these birds were believed to be an omen of doom. Triss, however, did not believe the night jars were an omen. It was simply birds migrating. A while later at the temple, Iola, a priestess with the second sight, prepares to attempt to gain a vision showing them where Ciri is, but Triss stops her and asks to go into trance with her, which was quite dangerous, but Triss insisted. Ciri had saved her once too at the Dwarven caravan, so she owed her this much. Afterwards, Triss laments that it is now too late to go after Ciri, Geralt or Yennefer, to save them. Too late to join the war effort. Too late for everything. At the next lodge meeting, they are eventually convinced by Fringilla Vigo that the castle Vilgefort is hiding in is Castle Stiga. So a group of sorceresses is sent there to investigate, but it turns out Fringilla had lied to protect Geralt. So Sabrina, Kira, and Triss were sent to blow Castle Stiga to pieces to make sure no one ever found evidence of their failure. Not too long after these events, there was a meeting at Sintra to talk of peace. Triss was also there and looked upon the portrait of the pretender Ciri. She thought to herself that perhaps it was better this way. Ciri would be safe. After these peace talks, the Lodge decided they wanted more control on the world and summoned Ciri to the Lodge where she was informed of what her role in the world would be. 
Siri asked for time to think about it and time to talk to Geralt about it. This was allowed, but Triss would ride with Siri and Yennefer. On the way to Rivia, where they would meet Geralt, Yennefer and Triss bickered incessantly about Geralt. Yennefer eventually said that she wanted to grab Triss's hair right about now, to which Triss yelled back to try it and she'd scratch her eyes out. They then fell silent as Ciri galloped back and told them of the pogrom happening in Rivia. They rushed to the burning town and soon were also attacked by the enraged mob. Triss grabbed Yennefer and pleaded with her to run, but Yennefer would not leave. Yennefer was knocked unconscious, however, and Triss dragged her away from the crowd. This time, Yennefer told Triss to teleport them out of there, but now Triss stood her ground. She would face her fear. They then started casting spells together, but Yennefer was distracted and her thoughts lingered, so Triss conjured a spell of her own, later named Marigold's Hailstorm, a spell that was never registered as it was never repeated again. Triss had an injured mouth and spoke slurred and distorted, she was really trying to cast Alzur's thunder. Icy hailstones the size of chicken eggs now fell on Rivia, and Yennefer was able to throw up a shield the last second above Triss and her to spare them. When the hailstorm abated, they quickly ran to Geralt's side. Geralt was lying in a pool of blood, and Yennefer desperately tried to heal him with her magic. Triss knew that the spell Yennefer was casting required great amounts of energy. She also knew it would not help. The spell exhausted Yennefer, and Triss was surprised she'd kept up for so long. Ciri, through the power of the unicorn Ihwaraquax, then healed Geralt and Yennefer and asked everyone to help carry them to the boat that had appeared nearby. Triss helped to pick up Geralt, and she could have sworn she smelled the perfume of litanade, coral. When Ciri got into the boat with Geralt and Yennefer, she asked Triss to apologize to the lodge for her, but she cannot stay if Geralt and Yennefer cannot either. Triss asked her if she could come with her. But Ciri said she did not know what she asked, but that she would see her again. The boat then disappeared like a ghost. Triss thought to herself that they would never meet again. And this is where the books end and the games start. When The Witcher 1 starts, you run into Triss immediately at Kaer Morhen, where she helps fend off the Salamandra attack and is wounded in the process. Geralt is then tasked with brewing a potion for her with all natural ingredients to help heal her up, as she is, of course, allergic to magical potions. As the Witcher and Triss then part ways to find the lost Witcher Berengar and to find out more about Salamandra, Triss teleports to Vizima to investigate what she can there by using her extensive network of contacts to gather information. When Geralt fights the Salamandra sorcerer Azar Javed in the swamp, Triss finds Geralt unconscious and teleports him to her house in Vizima, where Geralt overhears her speak to another sorceress by use of magic. This sorceress is likely Kira Metz, who Triss is on Foltest's council with, as her image in the mirror looks somewhat like her. Kira warns Triss to be careful, as Geralt can be very perceptive and he cannot guess what she hides from him, which we can assume is the work of the Lodge. Triss doesn't mention the conversation or the other sorceress's interest in Salamandra to Geralt, though. Even when he asks about it, she deflects the question. She then tells Geralt of some magical anomalies in Vizima and hopes he might help her investigate them. They discuss Geralt's loss of memory for a while, and Triss recommends Geralt build a stable personality. And by that she means he needs to take a stand on the world's problems because a strong identity might help restore his memory. Triss had read his memory to find out what's been happening to Geralt in the meantime when she found him in the swamp, and Geralt asks her if she couldn't just tell him what she saw instead. But Triss says she doesn't want to do that for fear Geralt would turn into her vision of Geralt. So Geralt agrees to help her with the magical anomalies then, and asks about the conversation Triss had in the mirror. Triss assures him it was nothing important, but to get the information she needed, she had to make some promises and she couldn't tell Geralt about them. When Geralt is ready to leave, Triss finally tells him about a merchant called Luvarden, who is hosting a banquet and wants to talk to Geralt. Geralt is reluctant at first, but Triss notes that Princess Ada will be there at the banquet as well, and so will Triss herself so Geralt agrees to go. Later, at the banquet, Triss introduces Geralt to Velarat, King Foltest's right hand, and Thaler of the Secret Service of Temeria. She then warns Geralt to watch what he says around the people at the banquet while she goes to speak with Luvarden. Geralt soon realizes that Princess Ada, who is also at the banquet, knows something, but she requires a catablepa steak, preferably rare, to appease. So Geralt asks Triss to conjure one up. 
Tris notes that sorcery at parties is very unseemly, but she agrees to magic up some meat anyway. When Geralt speaks with Triss again, she informs him that Lou Varden has an offer for him that she thinks he should accept. To which Geralt asks, sure you're not using me as one of your tools? And Triss answers, only in bed, Witcher. Only in bed. A while later in the game, you return to Triss and tell her whether you chose to side with the Scoia'tael or the Flaming Rose, and to tell her you placed the censers she asked. Triss then tells Geralt that a boy named Alvin was the source of the strange magical anomalies, she explains he must have elder blood as well, and that they will need to go and get him. However, Shani won't let Triss just take Elvin, so Triss asks Geralt to fetch him instead. Once you've brought Elvin to Triss, she tells Geralt to find Shani and end their relationship while also informing her that Elvin was to stay with Triss. If you don't do this, Triss won't want to talk with you anymore. After doing so, Geralt gets his hand on a telecommunicator. And when he shows Triss, she realizes they could use traces left by the device to find the Salamandra hideout. The last communication, however, was with Radovid of Redania, and Triss pinpoints the king's location for Geralt to find as well. Afterwards, she also asks Geralt to give her a symbolic gift to pledge his love to her. After a stiff drink with Dandelion and Zoltan, Geralt decides to give Triss a ring. But Triss also expects Geralt to spend more time with Alvin and says, The boy needs some discipline. So Geralt goes ahead and sternly speaks with Alvin to appease Triss. They then attend a meeting at the new Narakord Inn regarding information on Salamandra which is crashed by Salamandra. After striking down the attack, Triss teleports Geralt to the Salamandra hideout. Unfortunately, the attack on the hideout ends in disaster for Geralt and he has to flee for Zima for a while by use of another teleport from Triss. While in the outskirts, Dandelion meets up with Geralt and tells him Triss feels they should lay low for a while. A while later, Geralt finds Alvin in the village and asks him how he got there. He says, while at Triss's house, there were men coming up the stairs and Triss told him to hide under the bed. Triss and the men argued and Alvin could smell burnt flesh, and the men then beat Triss and a man in glasses kept asking where Alvin was. Triss insisted she teleported him to a friend in Kovir. The man then said something about playing with her, but Triss yelled that Geralt would find him and kill him, and then she kicked him between the legs and the men started crying. The others were afraid to get close to her because she started casting spells, but then they searched the room and found Alvin. They put him in a bag and took him away, but Alvin closed his eyes and teleported away. Afterwards, Geralt meets up with Dandelion again, who suddenly remembers he still has a Dimeritium amulet for Alvin that he completely forgot about even though Triss hammered it into his head. He also has a letter from Triss for Geralt, which stated that Geralt should not return to Vizima for a while, and that she knew Alvin was there because she traced his magical teleportation. She asks Geralt to please look out for him and make sure he wears the amulet, and that she awaits his return. When Geralt finally returns to Vizima, the non-humans have attacked the town and Foltest has returned. Triss is at the castle to advise Foltest, although Foltest doesn't seem very pleased with how his advisors handled the situation in his absence, and that includes Triss. Geralt asks Triss if she knew how to deal with Ada's curse, so Triss tells him she thinks the safeguards Geralt had put in place years ago were sabotaged by someone close to the princess. The next few appearances with Triss will only occur if Geralt chose a neutral witcher path so he will not be aided by either Yavin from the Squiatel or Siegfried from the Flaming Rose. As Geralt fights his way through the town and eventually the Salamandra hideout nearby, Triss shows up to aid him in battle, stating she could hardly desert him. She snatched a key to the crypt before she left the castle so they can enter the tombs below. Geralt asks her how things at the front are and Triss tells him the battle is quite even. Foltest has reached out to the lodge for help and they have agreed to help him restore order. This was the lodge's plan all along, the secret Triss wasn't allowed to tell Geralt about. Geralt then enters the catacombs while Triss fights back the mutants attacking the entrance. Geralt first asks Triss to come with him because staying there was too dangerous, but Triss notes she didn't need his permission to cause trouble, nor he hers. She then shoes him into the catacombs, saying she detests tearful goodbyes. When Geralt emerges victoriously and informs Triss that the Flaming Rose is behind Salamandra, they quickly return to Vizima, where they're informed of a Redanian and Temerian alliance. 
Foltest and Triss strike a deal as well, making Triss his royal advisor. Foltest notes that no doubt the Lodge would have some influence too, and warns her not to turn into Philippa. She's too pretty for that. Geralt and Triss then hurry through the city to get to the Order's headquarters. When they arrive, Geralt tricks Triss into thinking he's out of potions, and while she goes to get some for him, he enters the cloister. When he's teleported to a vision of the world of the White Frost, he encounters a vision of Triss, who helps him fight through the blizzard. And when they get to the end, she leaves him to fight the Grand Master. When the game ends, it is said that Triss does indeed become the royal advisor, and the Lodge gains substantial influence. Which leads us to the events of The Witcher 2, where we find Triss in bed with Geralt when they awake at the Tamarian camp, ready for battle. They discuss war and dreams for a while until Geralt leaves to meet with Foltest. As the battle for the castle of Lavalette rages on, a dragon suddenly appears and attacks Foltest. Geralt, Foltest and Roach run for their lives as Triss uses a magical barrier to prevent the group from being crushed underneath the rubble. After the battle, when Geralt is imprisoned for the murder of King Foltest, Triss awaits him outside the prison along with Roach and they flee for Flotsam. Triss was now no longer the royal advisor and she lost her home in Vizima. They call her Witcher's Mistress and King Slayer's Whore. Geralt asks Triss to take care of his wounds and to tell him everything she can about Yennefer, even the things that might hurt. And so they spent most of their journey talking. When they arrive in Flotsam, they're attacked by Squiatel on the forest roads. Triss creates a magical barrier around them which allows them to flee towards the city, although it takes a great deal of strength from her. They make it to Flotsam and are approached by a soldier who informs them of what's going on in town and tells them of the inn and the brothel. Triss notes the brothel sounds especially interesting. They meet up with Dandelion and Zoltan at the inn and discuss what happened in Geralt's absence. Triss tells them of a meeting between the lords and ladies of Temeria who tried to decide who would get what of the land, but the meeting didn't lead to much and neither Triss nor any other sorceresses were invited. As they sit around talking, the Kairin attacks Flotsam again and Triss notes that someone's casting spells and at the docks they run into Sheila de Tanzarville, whom Triss has a rather rocky friendship with. They exchange a few unpleasantries and Geralt decides to team up with Sheila to kill the Kairin. Triss now hangs out at the inn with Roach's blue stripes. She now knows every shit joke anyone's ever thought of, and she now knows how to burp out the official title of the Emperor of Nilfgaard without reaching for beer. She also heard all about Shorty's 16 children, all named after Temerian troop divisions, and she knows his nickname has nothing to do with his manhood. She actually likes them, and one of them even proposed to her. When Geralt goes out to find out more about the Cairn, he runs into Triss again outside of Flotsam, who asks where he's going, and she also tells him to stay out of this business. When Geralt notes she turned pale when they met Sheila, Triss says he must have imagined it, but Geralt insists. Triss tells him Sheila is a very powerful sorceress, and she's devious and manipulative. She was well aware Geralt had lost his memories, but pretended not to know. Triss doesn't know what her true intentions might be, though. After their little chat, they go to meet Cedric, an elf who might know more about the Cairn. Cedric notes Triss has a lovely smell. Once they got the information they needed, Triss teleports to the spot the Cairn was last seen at and Geralt follows on foot. They inspect the area together and Triss realizes the Cairn is sick. It's dying. It's also highly venomous and Triss recommends he makes an Ostmer potion before the fight. She then says she has to take care of some things and leaves Geralt for a while until they meet up again in the inn. If you got the Blue Stripe statue, you can ask her to remove it although she does have a good laugh at your expense. Tristan informs Geralt of Kirin ap Esnalen, Jordveth's right-hand man, who is being held on the barge. They decide to pay him a visit to see if he knows anything. Triss pretends to be a healer to get onto the barge and using her magic they keep him awake enough to talk to him. Kirin mentions Roses of Remembrance and after Geralt has a flashback again, Triss tells him she could help him bring back his memory completely with the help of a Rose of Remembrance. So they find the elven ruins that have the roses together. In the garden, they come across a beautiful statue surrounded by roses of remembrance. Triss tells Geralt of the legend of the roses that says they need to be nourished with blood or they'll wilt. They also wilt if they're sold, but if you give the rose to someone you love, it will live forever. So Geralt gives Triss the rose he plucked, noting that if the legend is true, 
it shouldn't wilt. They're then interrupted by a group of three exceptionally thick humans who plan to remove the beautiful statue from the garden. Trist does not approve of their course of actions, and when one of them says they can just remove the heads and move the statue in pieces, Trist tells them to break off their own heads. The three then insult her, and of this, Geralt does not approve. So the three die a horrible death, and Geralt and Triss instead enjoy each other's company rather intimately in the elven bathhouse beneath the ruins. Afterwards, Triss starts her work on a spell to give Geralt his memory back, and Geralt goes to talk to Jordveth. That troubles Triss, and she notes he could also drop everything to go find Yennefer once he has his memory back, and she'd come with him. She owes him and Yennefer that. Geralt tells her that, no matter what, he doesn't want to lose her. Geralt then goes to meet with Jorveth, and later Letho, but after he returns to Flotsam, depending on your choices, there's either a pogrom going on, or a feast. Regardless, Triss is missing, and the last person to be seen with her was Cedric. Geralt eventually finds out that Cedric is in the forest, dying from a wound inflicted while he tried to protect Triss from Letho. He could not prevent Letho from taking Triss and forcing her to teleport them both to Upper Edern, however. So, Geralt then chooses a side and travels to Upper Edern as well, to look for Triss. Triss, as it turns out, teleported into a ditch near Vergen, and Letho left her there. She was then found by a troll who nursed her back to health, after which she left and tried to find Philippa to tell her everything she'd found out so far, but instead she ran into Cynthia. She was a Nilfgaardian spy who pretended to be Philippa's apprentice, Cynthia then compressed Triss and hid her tiny figure into a tiny hollow statue. Geralt finds the statue, but he doesn't realize Triss is inside, and he unknowingly delivers her to Shilard Fitz Usterlin, a Nilfgaardian diplomat, who had Asira va Anahid decompress her in Loch Muin, after which he kills Asira as he found out she was a member of the Lodge. He then tortures Triss to gain information from her about the rest of the Lodge members and their plans. When Geralt finds Philippa Eilhart in the dungeons in Loch Muin and chooses to find and free Triss, Philippa implies Triss also isn't as innocent as Geralt thinks. Geralt eventually cuts his way through the Nilfgaardian camp and finds and frees Triss. She was pretty beat up, but told Geralt she didn't tell them a thing, although the Nilfgaardian Geralt spoke to before told him she had confessed after they showed her confessions of other Lodge members. Geralt then tells her he knows of the Lodge, that she was a part of the Lodge, and that the Lodge was behind Demaven's assassination. Triss, however, tells Geralt that the Lodge was ruled by Philippa and Sheila for a long time now, to the point where Triss wasn't even invited to meetings anymore. They didn't trust her, because she was too close to Geralt. And Sheila feared Geralt. The Lodge tried to convince Triss that her relationship with Geralt didn't bother them, and that it suited them well. They used her to feed Geralt select information and twisted facts. At one of the Lodge's meetings, Triss had asked how they proposed to overthrow Demavent, whom the Lodge perceived as the weakest link among the ruling kings. That was the last time she was invited to a meeting. After Demavent's death, Triss became suspicious, but she had no evidence and Philippa continuously brushed her off. So while Geralt was busy talking to Jordveth in Flotsam and Sheila was busy with the Cairn, Triss scanned parts of Sheila's megascope. That's when she found out Sheila had dealings with Letho. Unfortunately, right after, she was teleported away with Letho. Letho did tell Triss afterwards that the Lodge had commissioned the Witchers of the School of the Viper to kill Demavend. Triss tells Geralt they could take this chance to restore the Council and Conclave. They need to have capable sorcerers at the courts again, and Triss is very willing to reveal any plans Sheila de Tanzarville and Philippa Eilhard have had so far, to prevent a nationwide witch hunt. They make their way to the talks together and split up just before because Triss feels they shouldn't arrive there together. At the talks, Triss steps forward and reveals Sheila's part in the assassination of Demavend and Foltest. Of course, the talks are then interrupted by a dragon and Triss yells at Geralt to find Sheila and stop her. After the battle is over, Triss helps Geralt climb up the wall and tells him of everything that happened in Loch Muin and that Letho is waiting for Geralt in the Temerian camp. On their way to meet him, they come across some soldiers who found Jordveth, who is an obvious pain. They kill the soldiers, and Geralt asks Triss if she can help Jordveth, but Triss says it was high magic that harmed him and it will take time. So Triss stays with Jordveth to teleport him away to Vergen, while Geralt goes to meet Letho. After their meeting, Triss and Geralt exit Loch Muin together, and from the start of Witcher 3 we can assume Geralt and Triss broke off their relationship soon after, as Geralt regained his memory. 
and then Triss moved to Novigrad to help sorcerers in need. And this is where Triss's story in the books and the first two games ends, and we arrive at the story of The Witcher 3. I hope you enjoy Triss's story, and see you next time. <laughs>